and it is organized by uh, the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities at the Department of uh, Humanities of Ca' Foscari University of Venice and namely by Federico Boschetti, Tiziana Mancinelli, Paolo Monella and Linda Spinazze. So thank you very much to my colleagues. Uh, and today it's in connection with um, with the Research Institute for Digital and Cultural Heritage and the Center for Humanities and Social Change at Kafoskari University of Venice. Uh, so welcome to my colleagues and co-organizers uh, Elena Grandi, Le Lorenzo Calvelli, who is uh, in, in will be a bit later uh, join us and uh, Massimo Vargian from the Research Institute and Barbara del Mercato and Shaul Bassi from the HSC Center who uh, will not be present today. Um, my name is Franz Fischer, I'm the director of the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities and uh, before I introduce you to the today's speaker to Elisa Corro, um, I will briefly give you some practical instructions how we uh, used to run this, these <coughs> seminars. So there is um, uh, a chat uh, uh, you can open when you click in the upper right corner on the, on the bubble. Uh, uh, please uh, switch off your microphone. Carlo Giupponi, we hear you coughing. Uh, no problem, but uh, if you click on the screen, then uh, the microphone the microphone and the video camera appears and there you can uh, mute or switch on and disactivate um, this functionality. Uh, and there will be enough space and time to uh, for discussion after the presentation. Uh, you can then please post or write uh, your uh, questions uh, into the chat and then I can, can read your question or give you uh, 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 the voice uh, and then you can elaborate or um, give some explanation of your, of your question. Um, yeah, so that's most important. As soon as we start, please also, so right now it's fine, but when we start, please switch off also your video. I think uh, it's better for the quality of the transmission because Elisa is, will be running a video uh, slide presentation uh, and you can switch the video on uh, when the discussion starts and then we see how the quality uh, works. Um, this presentation and the whole seminar will be uh, recorded and uh, after uh, the presentation we will upload it to uh, our YouTube channel. Um, so please be aware when you contribute uh, that uh, you will be uh, forever connected with, uh, 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 with YouTube. Um, and uh, all the materials including the slides uh, are will be downloadable very soon from our GitHub repository. Uh, everything is uh, interlinked from our website, so you should find all the materials, including the link to the YouTube video uh, from our website and further information. Um, that's as far as regards practical things. Um, Massimo, would you like to uh, say a word of welcome to the audience as, uh, for, as a representative of the Research Institute? Well, yes, with pleasure. Welcome to anybody. And uh, I'm Massimo Varlian from the Research Institute in Digital and Cultural History and also uh, from the Center for Humanities and Social Change. Uh, sorry, there's a big background noise. I, I hope I'm not the cause of it. Here it's Hello? everything fine. Everything is ah, okay. fine. I can hear you very clearly without noise. Okay, okay. So that's just my problem. No problem. Uh, just one thing to say. Uh, the reason for this joint seminar is first that we have uh, an ongoing collaboration between the Research Institute and the Center for Digital and Public Humanities. This is one nice way to make it happen. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we started a few weeks ago a series of seminars on water and the humanities uh, that has been going through many themes related to water and in many cases of course water in the lagoon the seminar will actually continue uh, in the next weeks and the next week uh, thursday not wednesday there will be diego calaon which is also here that will be talking uh, with us about uh, sinking venice thinking venice and uh, <laughs> so we hope you can join the meeting that's it for the moment and uh, thanks to all, of course, and uh, looking forward to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. OK, 
Okay, I would uh, like to ask you to switch off your microphones now and also your video and then I will introduce you to our today's speaker, Elisa Corot. Elisa has been a research fellow at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities since September last year. She holds a doctoral degree from Kafoskari University in Classics and Archaeology. And she has been involved in countless archaeological research projects in the Veneto region. Among others, she participated in the excavations of the Monastery of the Saints Ilario Benedetto at Mira on Terra Ferma, so right next to Maestre, where she recently found uh, the earliest burial places of the Doge of Venice, if I'm not mistaken. So this is really deep history of Venice. Uh, and Elisa is especially engaged with community projects uh, and the application of immersive technologies in order to connect people to their past and the history of the landscape. Unfortunately, a very recent uh, uh, event uh, called Numbers and Cultures in collaboration with the University uh, Popolare di uh, Campo, Naga Campo Nogara uh, involving students from uh, public schools with archaeological data in the local environment uh, had to be postponed because of the coronavirus emergency. Um, Today, uh, Elisa will be talking about uh, her research projects of uh, research pro of her fellowship here at our uh, center uh, about the interaction between human and natural events uh, involving the Venice Lagoon and the countryside during Middle Ages with a focus on digital tools for taking into account the human, human dimension and highlighting the history of a community and sharing knowledge and values. So uh, welcome to Elisa Corot. Thank you for, for coming today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share my screen before to start. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Uh, um, just, uh, yeah? just a can reminder, you, everyone, please uh, switch off your video. You can do this by clicking on the screen, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the camera icon will appear at the bottom of the screen, and you can switch off your camera. So I hope then the that the transmission will be of better quality if you do so. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's can all. I start? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, we can start. Thank you very much. So, okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Franz. Thank you all. It is a honor for me to be here this afternoon, this today. Uh, in this seminar, thanks to the results of the recent research studies of the team I work with, I want to consider with you how human history and also mankind can change over the centuries and especially when it is necessary to uh, manage lands and water in particular. Um, so it, se it, se it seems unbelievable, but uh, we will see that uh, the entire alpine ecosystem has a crucial role in the transformation of the plants and especially in the plant nearby Venice due to the strong impact of the most important European rivers. So there is a sort of dynamic working balance among each single independent element. And in the second part of the seminar, I will show you new options, um, how extreme events of the past can be used to create a new knowledge and more awareness because of their characteristics. And in a kind of citizen science or community science approach, thanks to particular digital experiences. So for archaeologists, I'm going to talk about the Anthropocene, this proposed geological epoch for the most recent geologic time period has been human influenced. It has been a history of uh, opportunities, um, adaptations and interventions directly connected with a series of changes realized during centuries that has um, triggered a series of chain reaction of the landscape in which today people live, as in the Newton third laws of motion state. So for every action in nature, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
So the landscape represents uh, the theater of these events and the resources to draw on and the obstacles to be overcome. So as a theater, indeed, thanks to digital tools, it is now possible to um, take the human dimension into account and highlighting the history of a community and sharing knowledge and values. So among many factors that we need to be considered, water management is one of the most important and most incisive that determine the growth and the development of city. So for instance, was the practice to contain flows of water a good idea? I'll start from the example of flood or inundation. So today floods are often extreme events, uh, primarily originated from a river in the hinterland, but also um, determined by sea level in the coastal area. Okay, so the correlation between natural flood and hydraulic management strongly affected uh, urbanized landscapes and their geomorphology, culture, and society. So um, correlation between different areas which have been hit by extreme um, floods, both in modern times as in the past, can provide a better um, and a more comprehensive overview at the larger scale of the effects of the landscape management. And for example, uh, the studies of the major Europe rivers as the Rhone River from Switzerland to France, the Rhine River, the Danube River in uh, central Germany and the post system uh, in Italy highlights an increasing trend in flood risk in Europe with more frequent and more intense flooding events for the decades to come. So in recent years, most paleo flood studies concerning European rivers have adopted different kind of approach, highlighting um, all the importance of this, this area for the transformation of the entire alpine ecosystem and underline the impact of human influences. So, um, researchers are indeed, uh, um, how can I say, based on specific uh, techniques, um, often with uh, the correlation within historical archive, geological data, with the estimation of flood deposition found in the stratigraphic sequences of the bed of the river, database of radiocarbon date, and climatic um, analysis, as this one in particular. Um, also with an undestructive approach, okay, using, for instance, innovative technologies as uh, the um, core scanner can be, as you can see in the picture here. And so in this branch of research, studies are always combined with, uh, with new innovative kind of analysis. Um, in Italy, in the Veneto region, uh, especially in the plan, uh, hydrography has a key role in uh, constraining land use uh, dynamics. So moreover, um, recent studies demonstrate that understanding it, its modification over time can greatly uh, enhance our knowledge of the rise, development and fall of single settlements or complex societal systems. Uh, so the integration of archaeological and geomorphological um, research in a comprehensive um, geo-archaeological approach can provide the best clues for deciphering the relations between men and rivers. And this is what I'm doing with my current research project called Venice River Collection. So collecting rivers, uh, understand the environment and transfer uh, the information uh, about history and identity to people through digital tools. And furthermore, the relation between recent past and uh, ancient floods can provide a more accurate knowledge uh, between men and environmental relationships and um, a better understanding of the responsible elements uh, of flood variability. And for Venetian coastal landscape, we have also to consider um, ancient inundation from the sea, from, from the lagoon, uh, another factor of environmental change that may modify coastal landscape and the natural balance between man and the environment. So the importance of um, relative sea level rise is considered also uh, in environmental um, reconstruction of Europe since the end of the Middle Ages as a parameter for the comprehension um, 
for instance, of the evolution of the society in a very global perspective. And I remember only now, but I'm happy to say that today is also the Earth Day, so this is a way to celebrate it. Um, so, defining um, a long-term long geoarchaeological background uh, is important to identify a common center of gravity in the natural and cultural evolutions of these territories. So the value that human being assigned to a specific territory in a specific time is the key to understand the effect of these interventions and the actual environmental dynamics. So anthropic changes realized during centuries has triggered a series of chain reaction in which today people live, especially for the importance of land use drivers. And if we know that, maybe um, higher awareness of such environmental and societal threats can be a better scenario of the future through the production of new knowledge. But um, let me show you now uh, two examples to see, two models uh, directly from Italy. I want to thank my supervisor, uh, Professor Paolo Mozzi of uh, the Department of Geosciences of the University of Padua and Professor Saulo Gelichi of our Department of Humanities and also the Archaeological Superintendency, Superintendent. So studies, my PhD uh, thesis highlight, has highlighted and confirmed that the changes in the hydrographic network affected the evolution of city and settlement uh, in the Po Delta area. A very famous natural ecosystem, also very beautiful to visit. So the geoarchaeology of Adria or the city of Adria, the city that gave the name to the Adriatic Sea, um, highlights the human impact and the resilience of settlement in face of flooding. Uh, the relation between um, cities and water management is essential to understand the landscape transformation. So we analyzed the, the evolution of the river systems um, around the city uh, through different kinds of analysis, for instance, um, remote sensing, historical maps, digital terrain model, um, radiocarbon dates, archaeological data, thanks to the National Archaeological Museum of Vedria, and the execution of manual course nearby the city. So, important hydrographic changes occurred in this area and in the surrounding um, during the last three millennia. And the Po River was thus flowing through Adria, then shifted ten of, tens of kilometers away, leaving uh, um, his route free to use for a smaller river that is still there today. But this is more um, visible, more uh, yeah, more visible in the south part of the city. Indicates here with a red cycle. Okay, so um, with the shifted of the river, in the pl the plan stabilized, allowing a soil formation, as you can see here in the red. So Adria flourished as a prominent harbor city in the northern Adriatic region in the following centuries, and thus. The development of the Iron Age urban settlement of Edria started to grow in elevation, as you can see in the picture, and um, in the period one. And uh, such stable situation um, protected throughout the Roman Age, in the period two, late antiquity, period three, until the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, so, what's happened um, after the end of Middle Ages, about in about the 10th century AD? And this is more clear in the north part of the city when the alluvial, an alluvial event starts a phase of sedimentation. The event was due to the opening of two channels 10 of kilometers away from Adria. And the reason of the opening was probably to need to manage uh, a bigger river, maybe the Adige, as the Adige could be, uh, or to damage land for a geopolitical balance, I don't know. But the, archeo the archaeological, sorry, I went back. I was... The archaeological um, evidence of that is the first San Giovanni church, the probably built in the 9th century AD or before, and that was partially buried by the sediment. <clears throat> so our recent. Um, Sorry, okay. 
our recent studies, uh, um, thanks to Paolo Mozzi again, and also to Silvia Piovan, uh, she is our colleague of the Department of um, Geography at the University of Padua, uh, demonstrate that this also happens in a regional framework, framework on enhanced flooding in the Western Alps, Northern Eastern Italy, and in the Mediterranean area during the first part of the medieval climate anomaly. This is wonderful. So after that period, extensive pit sedimentation with a wide mesh area, as you can see in the picture, around the city, chronologically framed between the 11th century and the 15th century AD, indicates a drastic decrease of flooding around Adria, probably for human management of channels. And uh, fluvial sedimentation started again after the 15th century AD, due to the human reactivation of other channels that deliver the large amounts of sediment toward the city. Okay, so um, uh, fluvial sedimentation here led to the complete, as you can see here, the complete burial of the early medieval church. And documents from the middle of the 15th century describe the dramatic outcomes of um, the floods that occur in the city in that period, leaving only a few buildings untouched. And however, historical maps of the center of Adria um, reflect the present day situation. So the religious institutions, uh, the church and the city cathedral today in the same position, I mean, above the earlier church, buried during the series of sedimentary events. So we suppose that the maintenance of the same position can be related to the, to the efficient river for management actuated by the Venetian government since its domain on the region. So, other community was resilient to flooding and always attempted to manage the channels and the opening and reactivation of the channels were, was probably um, facilitated by um, regional climatic phases and uh, of river instability and possibly also by local um, human intervention. So um, the local community here display a significant resilience and uh, while suffering from the situation as, re as recorded by uh, written sources, did not abandon the area and attempted to manage the water. Um, however, it, is, it was only with the intervention of the Venetian government, an external authority, and from the 16th century onwards, that the channels were, with much effort, um, completely controlled. So this geopolitical frame is very, very well studied by my colleague Silvia Piovan from the Department of Geography of Padua, and she is able to detect and analyze um, in such a perfect way all the geographical and political aspects of, related to Adria and the surrounding area. And this is the amazing buried church uh, used as, at the present as a, as a crypt, free to visit. So, I suggest you to go to visit Adria and uh, oh sorry. What's I think happening? this is a short short interruption. We have a um, mm -mm. troll here, so we had the, this is not the first time. So interestingly, you wouldn't expect it to a humanities seminar online, but uh, I think we have our okay. our center police uh, in the back. So sorry for okay. this. No, no problem. Thank you. So um, this is the amazing buried church and used as, at the present as a crypta and it is free to visit. So I suggest you to go to Adria first, see the National Archaeological Museum and then also the religious institutions. So and ask to visit, in, to visit also the buried church, the today crypta. And um, the second example I want to show you today is a medieval monastic is another area another area a monastic precinct in Venice countryside that represent another local case of a study um, that reveals how in order to maintain a strategic position in the river network anthropogenic landscapes transformation can be dramatic i want to thank all the teamwork again uh, so san Sergio 
the director, Paolo Mozzi, and Sandra Primond, our geologist, the multidisciplinary lab of International Center for Theoretical Physics of Trieste, and Cecilia Moine, our colleague, and the archaeological uh, superintendency. So this kind of research um, is a guideline, okay, so to understand actual environmental dynamics, to predict how um, new alteration will modify features of landscape and life of local community. So Sant'Ilario um, Monastery is, lo is located in the southwest countryside of Venice, and it was one of the most prestigious institutions uh, of early medieval Venice. It was the site of many local burials during the early Middle Ages. And the story is that, um, is this, uh, the Doges of Venice allowed the monks of San Servolo, as you can see the picture, an island south of the city, to move to a more suitable place. Uh, thus, the religious community obtained the chapel of Sant'Ilario and the surrounding area. The location was different from the other monasteries of the lagoon. Uh, so not in the middle of the lagoon, but on the mainland in the countryside uh, in a, such a perfect landscape, ideal landscape. Mm -hmm. So the Venetian lagoon is, and its hinterland have been greatly and constantly modified over the centuries, both by both artificial and natural events. And the existing southern border between dryland and lagoon is now completely artificial. And it was realized to protect, to, or to divide the lagoonal environment from fresh water. And however, this border has changed over the centuries, as you can see in the picture, in the red dotted lines, thanks to Sandra Primon reconstructions. So this landscapes, um, this landscape results from a strong process of exploitation and human intervention on it have literally overwritten um, environmental features. But it was the diversion of a huge river towards Sant'Ilario, towards the site in the 12th century that triggered a um, chain reaction on envir environment and uh, with changes and um, with this diversion, uh, water routes were between dry land and lagoon were totally transformed, rivers were interrupted, and the and fluidly position and hydro hydrologic variation generated a series of several swamps. However, it is not sure if um, this uh, kind of seriousness of the event um, has been immediately um, perceived and how fast the environment was started to degenerate. Okay, so a new and a direct navigable route was suddenly opened and providing to the monastery even more strategic position. Mm, but however, this successful exploitation did not last long. The environment was changing fast and the utility of that territory was decreasing and part of the monastic community uh, moved to Venice come back to Venice. Only the war events occurring in the half of the 13th century, when the monastery was occupied, partially destroyed by the enemy's forces, determined the definitive desertion of Sant'Ilario in favor of Venice. However, we do not have to think to a desolate large swamps. Local communities and minor noble families continue to manage land and building mills and villas and protecting their personal property. So the minimal importance of this area for Venetian is clear. The city government turned its attention uh, on this area only to fix hydrological balance of the lagoon. Meanwhile, the inhabitants uh, continue to reclaim and to modify land and rivers and um, to maximize ex exploitation. And uh, while in the Middle Ages, in the, in the modern era, the main need was to prevent the flavial depositions, on the contrary, today, the Venetian lagoon is gradually becoming fully maritime. I was the problem instead of swampland, but we cannot understand all this transformation without the analysis of the history of the landscape and its exploitation. 
So what I'm trying to tell you with this uh, example is not only how the past recent or not okay uh, might be reconstructed but in so doing i hope to highlight the importance of uh, understand how people working in, on heritage approach and communicate with people relating today with these events not only increasing engagement uh, with place and memory assets but ways to create dialogue and disseminate a broader range of memories in, in a part participatory ways so but last but not least is important to understand how this approach can be used in particular kind of landscape or waterscape as the case of, as the Venetian could be this is the reason why immersive technologies could be the best solutions for to experiment to not only for the name itself immersive in this case of water but especially for the way you can identify um, yourself with the environment okay so now for instance can you imagine if uh, you did not hear the story of the monastery of Sant'Ilario for me uh, you just you just heard from me but only feel it uh, in an immersive room this is an immersive room this one it was uh, you are seeing um, was set in draw light a company I work with in partnership uh, during living in history project and ended last year and where we develop new solution for facilitate our this the dissemination of our search so for instance now uh, this uh, 30 second video very brief video uh, you're going to see uh, is a prototype okay proportion for uh, an for that that immersive room and tell you the changes of water over the century um, is based on uh, satellite image, as you can see here, and represent 20 years of our teamwork research studies. Uh, I mean, all the research I've just, I've just explained you before, uh, but in 30 seconds. So now I show you the video, but uh, this video has also an audio recording. And therefore, now I switch my microphone channel into stereo and it is better if you adjust your headphones volume now and then I'll be back here to you in 30 seconds. Okay, now you see, you can listen to me. And uh, now imagine if I could use um, uh, data to create something more <laughs> abstract, uh, where water is the main ingredient. I mean, these are only a prototypes, okay? Proportional for the massive view seen before for, of five meters uh, for um, three meters high. And the secret is to use a solid scientific base. Uh, in the next case, you will see a mosaic of, on the ground of the ancient church of Sant'Ilario, now at the National Archaeological Museum of Venice. And we've even, we've a very impressive visualization to describe the extreme event, the arrival of the river. Also, this one uh, was presented last year and uh, to test it to a limited number of people. And let me set the audio again and we will see you back in 30 seconds. It is only this one. Mm. Thank you. 
Okay, here I am again. Thank you for your time. <laughs> so now, okay, imagine if uh, the rising water in the video uh, could represent real hydrological data as a water level, etc. So as in the first video, see. So um, how to make visible uh, the wide invisible. Rafik Anadol is a media artist that is working on in the field of site-specific public art with Data, data and immersive installation. And he is able to create a hybrid relationship between architecture, in his case, and media arts with machine intelligence. This is not my case, my personal case, but I bring you this example because it is possible to use this kind of approaches for archaeology too. He did it, as you can see here. And this is a free video, so you can search free on the web. Uh, he did it in one of the most important archaeological sites in the world, Chatalhuyuk. It's an Neolithic settlement uh, which dates back thousand years, I think, yeah. And it is located on the southern end of Anatolian plateau in Turkey, okay. And uh, at this site worked also Dominic Lucas, a data mining creator of an open access repository for the Chatalhuyuk project that is it be able to collect and present data in uh, different forms i tell you this because uh, dominic lucas accepted to be a member of our summer school thanks also to diego calaon in digital public, public humanities and uh, also with um, also if with uh, the covid 19 emergency the school will be modified anyway Rafik Anadol uh, was the artist uh, that reinterpreted uh, 2.8 million data records uh, of 250,000 finds from Chatelwick Research Project Archive by employing machine learning algorithm. So uh, Anadol's media installation was on display as a part of an exhibition also called, named the, the Curious Case of Chatelwick as you can see from this video. And the end of the video is free and uh, is uh, very accessible online, so you can go to see it. And, um, okay. So the concept of immersive experience is to create uh, a relation with us, uh, with our landscape, is a team of research and experimentation, okay, for instance. This is what Swartz, John Swartz, a geographer, a geographer of Northumbria University from in Newcastle, England, argued when he tried to explain the importance to build an immersive experience, experience in this kind of landscape of heritage, landscape of complexity, paying attention to when you have to translate historical events into other forms. So this is the reason why researchers are interested in how people respond to immersive experiences with personal histories to highlight uh, what they cherish as heritage or perhaps downloading photos of families uh, relating to events. So in other words, that means that uh, memory scapes exist. And uh, is it now possible uh, to uh, communicate to the present community uh, these stories and also the awareness of those places in which today people live and how the interactions between men and the environment um, can be a way to respond to the today changes uh, in humans' relationship with the environment. Mm. Uh, this is a team that people uh, working on heritage, architecture and technology sectors um, use since long time to generate innovative ideas and make creative use of information, data and media to express complex information. Moreover, if you go to immersus.com, an artist, as you can see here, named Cher Davis, focused to the perception um, uh, of reality to the center human position in the world, to dehabituating perception 
question um, and recent sodizing has to our being the world. Osmos, for instance, um, is structured into three levels. So uh, earth, um, landscape and your interior body. And landscape can change continually, passing through a sort of cycles. And so the participant uh, may pass constantly between uh, changes immersed in transformation. And you can see the other part of the video um, online, on the web, on YouTube, uh, is free and accessible. But what I'm trying to say is to rethink of what virtual environment um, means so not, not only as a collection of separate solid objects in an empty space, okay, but um, giving priority also to environment uh, as a new kind of uh, conceptual um, and experiential working space. So a place that can be that can potentially uh, facilitate a dissolution of conventional boundaries between perceiver and perceived. And this appears very similar to what Harvard University is uh, trying to do. Uh, Harvard wants to uh, connect you um, with the urban scapes in particular way. Search pulses on the web, on Google. And uh, you can see that pulses is an ambient, um, completely, totally interactive, and experimental, an experimental installation that collects uh, real-time data, for instance, traffic uh, from the city through an algorithm, okay, and reinterprets uh, the dynamic information, uh, for instance, the intensity of traffic, to into interactive soundscapes. So they choose uh, the rhythm of the heart heartbeat. So then you can see the blankets, four blankets uh, that also are are there for um, encourage, but and, and visitors also to to listen as you can see here and also relax themselves so it's very beautiful um, oh, this is also an artistic way installation and Harvard wants to aims to to measure um, the unseen uh, indeed, as the neurosciences demonstrate, uh, it is possible to understand the relationship between emotions, uh, perceived emotions, and actual state of mind based on stimuli triggered by the built, in this case, environment through various modes of transportation. As you can see here, uh, maybe uh, by walking, uh, or cycling or driving or in subway. So um, the question are, um, how can we measure um, the unseen or the space around us or landscape or landscape in this case, well, in alternative ways. So how can we create um, correlation um, between man and environment? This project is called Genome of the Built Environment and is the application of new methods uh, through the use of uh, uh, a responsive technology. Responsive technologies, yeah. So I encourage you to go to see the, the free website uh, and see all the portfolio that uh, they have, that Harvard have. And these are, you can see, are the reaction of the brain. Uh, so the four regions of the brain with different uh, reactions. So Matt, it, maybe we, I can explain you better after during the mm, question time. Um, this is the same aim of the Chroma project. Uh, the last I want to show you today, uh, that uh, measure the emotive uh, states of the people uh, in that city or place through feeling, colors, and emotion. So Harvard wants to understand how mm, your mind works with the related environment through feeling and sensations. Those are all, all experimentation, okay, especially used by designer and architects. But mm, during my experience, my experience is I feel the need to get closer to, to this kind of approaches 
for a public use in a cultural heritage. So why don't you use um, this related um, to a strong data visualization for living our history, for instance? Because we, with this immersive storytelling, um, because this is, this is storytelling, it could be possible to feel the emotions related to an extreme events of the past. And in so doing, uh, you can at the same time make culture and create the awareness for the environment in which you live. I tried also a um, mind sensor very similar to the emotive uh, you can see here in the video. A kind of game where the aim was to relax and be happy. Uh, the app I tried, directly connected to the phone, helped you to relax also with soundscapes and visual images. It is not simple to use something like this, uh, um, especially if you are <laughs> anxious, but it, it is uh, an excellent it is excellent for a wide range of communication with real-time feedback on your mind. And for instance, it is useful for uh, uh, to understand how people can react uh, with their emotions and uh, you are transferring from, from the immersive experience. So. In archaeology, um, kind of um, approaches can be used to understand the past and uh, the interrelations between uh, with, such, with social identity, technology, cultural landscape and communities. Um, during my fellowship in the center, I could learn that um, digital and public humanities are a dialogue across disciplinary boundaries that will offer promising prospect for future research and an essential resource for uh, knowledge preservation, exchange and dissemination. My, my research so um, focus on um, focus to find the best digital um, tools, media tools to engage people um, and understand how different uh, media formats can communicate to different people. Uh, and the adoption of a more uh, emotional storytelling experience is considered for many author, uh, authors that, that you can find the references at the, under, at the end of the video um, to contribute to making knowledge even more accessible and engaging uh, for different kinds of audiences. So immersive experience creates a relaxed environment that raises self-confidence uh, establish establishes a new a universal way of communication so in this context in, in my ecological profile this is not a news uh, digital technologies led to produce innovative programs that engage communities individuals and professionals with culture from heritage sites and family memories so giving also new ways to understand and interpret and uh, um, spread information and model the past and moreover there there are also in digital geoarchaeology sorry back to the second in geoarchaeology there are um, scientists that with geoarchaeology wants to go one step further by also taking into account the dimension of uh, human environmental studies and aim to highlight the disregarded thematic that connect humanities natural sciences and informatics and finally there is also the maurizio fortes team the dig lab uh, at Duke University in North Carolina that a team specialized in archaeology and uh, new digital technologies that works in this direction, offering new projects regarding the digital cities, dividing them into uh, soundscape, smellscape city, I mean, for a multi-sensorial point of view. So we are working on this direction. And... Um, Storytelling is the best vehicle to create interest and empathy and stimulate imagination. And that's the reason why during my this year, uh, and thanks to the VDPH and the Department of Humanities, I'm part of different great teamworks projects focusing on emotive storytelling dedicated to the public and that you can find soon in the research area of the VDPH website. As uh, before, Marco Polo, the origin of Venice, uh, a video um, of urban landscape of Venice before the 
year 1000 and for uh, uh, an exhibition named Venice and Sozu, water sitting along the Silk Road. Venice is a river collection, my current research project that aims to create a, an online platform and the immersive practical experiences of, with a uh, university for kids, other, so, um, and, and uh, other projects promote cultural and um, cultural heritage, fostering the contamination between academic world and community with uh, living Venice in the past, for instance, an online platform or urban landscape and everyday life during the middle, middle ages. And finally, numbers and culture project. And this one in particular was um, um, involves some schools belonging to different municipalities nearby Venice. And the challenge uh, focuses on an interdisciplinary research that includes an open data search on the web as a way to describe with numbers the features of the present landscape, then a collection of historical memories, and then a present comparison of the landscape changes by uploading pictures, as you can see here, um, in, on the Instagram channels of the project. And then, thanks to a team of researchers in the VDPH, each class will analyze uh, they research data in real time uh, with a series of data um, visual, visualization processes. Uh, this is an example of a citizen science approach. It creates a dialogue and citizens are involved in the research and in the dissemination of the results. It's amazing for me. Now all these projects are suspended, as Franz said before, are suspended due to the COVID-19 emergency. But I hope that uh, they will restart all very soon. Um, this seminar is uh, also a um, storytelling test for you. <laughs> and you're part of it, I'm sorry. Uh, so if you are agree, agree, please give me your feedback and help me to grow. Um, I need it. Just scan the code with your phone and take part to a very quick and anonymous and completely anonymous survey for me. And I give you also the link in the chat. Uh, I passed the link in the chat uh, after the presentation. And uh, to conclude, um, stay there. Don't, don't don't go away. To conclude, you are going to see um, all the references I used for the seminar from general archaeology to particular archaeology, from digital uh, um, public heritage to particular. So I want to uh, thank you uh, all for listening my seminar. And I want to thank the DPH, the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities, especially the director, Franz Fischer, and the organizers of the seminars for giving me this opportunity of sharing my scientific works. Thank you also to the Research Institute for Digital and Cultural um, Heritage and to the Humanities and Social uh, Change Center for joining the initiative. And um, I wait for your question, but uh, especially for your consideration, please, because I, I need it. It is one of the first time in my short career that I can explain the whole works, I mean, uh, with the interplay with, between research and communication together. So, okay, I wait for you. Uh, now, I leave you, I would leave you with this 30, 40-second video, very emotional video of a Turkish university. Uh, the project is called, um, is named uh, Smile Project, a project where you can see um, the reaction of people when someone tell them uh, they look so beautiful. It's very simple. Uh, I want to leave you with this video because uh, as Stephen Hawking uh, usually said, remember to make sense of what you see. And for me, my research uh, becomes an even, an even more powerful tool when it taps into our emotions. So uh, see you in about uh, 40 seconds. Okay.
Okay, here I am. Here I am again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I finished. Thank you very much indeed, Elisa. I'm afraid I have to spoil the ex experience now. <laughs> So Google Meet is not exactly an immersive technology, but uh, thank you for bringing <laughs> for bringing us to all these uh, wonderful places, uh, including New York, which makes us nostalgic at the moment. So it's before the coronavirus tragedy, and um, yeah, I remind you that after the emergency, you have to bring the team to all those places of the lagoon at least. So. Uh, Please keep that in mind, <laughs> so we want to see these places also um, in presence. We have now uh, enough room for discussions, questions, uh, explanations, remarks, suggestions. Uh, Elisa, please post your the, the, the link to the survey for feedback into the, into the chat. Everyone who wants to pose a question, please uh, post your question into the chat, which you open in the, uh, if you click on the upper right corner, there's the, the speech bubble, and then the chat opens and you can post your questions. And I try to, and my team to keep track of um, contributions and questions. I then will read the question or ask you to uh, post your question yourself, uh, activating your microphone. Um, I'm opening the chat myself to orient myself. Okay, there's the link from Elisa. Yeah, thank you. And please pre try to be concise with your questions. If you need to elaborate on this, I can can give you some, some space. I'm happy to give you some space. Mm -hmm. Useful. So we had a peak of 84 uh, people attending your presentation. So that's our new record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I think uh, that's for a reason. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. So, we have questions. I, I'll check. I want to be fair. If I miss or if we miss uh, an intervention, please post your question once, once again. So, no problem. Mm. So, there is... Uh, 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 Rita Maria Bucciarelli, mm -hmm. who wants to intervene. Please, Rita Maria, if you uh, can switch on your microphone, pressing on the <laughs> button which appears when you click on the monitor, then uh, you can activate your microphone and pose your question. Rita Maria Bucciarelli, if you are in trouble right now, uh, just one remark. So, if people, ah, there we go. Okay, there she is almost. Direttore, mi sente un attimo. Io, noi siamo un gruppo questa sera che siamo qui per dare il nostro, il mio, do il mio giudizio critico da esperta e mi permetto di, eh, eh, ci ten tenevo molto perché la professoressa può apprezzare le cose che va, dico. Due minuti. Allora, complimenti perché la, ha dato un'ottima validazione scientifica del movimento e del suono. Primo complimento, giustificazione e validazione scientifica secondo le teorie fisiche. Complimenti per eh, come ha trasmesso il messaggio. Un attimo, un attimo. Mariana, non rompere. Uh, 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 complimenti, complimenti perché ha saputo darci il concetto di... Un attimo... Complimenti perché ci ha dato l'aspetto iconico dell'archeologia, dell le immagini parlavano, parlavano e aveva, si aveva quella manipolazione frastica, sintagmatica, che nella generalizzazione del linguaggio noi riproduciamo con i verbi e con la, le manipolazioni sintagmatiche. Lei invece con le immagini ha saputo trasmettere esattamente scientificamente il senso arcologico dell'immagine secondo il processo di elaborazione dei simboli terzo complimenti e finisco 
per la trasmissione dell'immagine, perché lei ha saputo trasmettere attraverso il teoria, la teoria fisica della emozional sintagmatica del dell'immagine del, eh, proprio dell'immagine artistica c'era il sorriso finale della, della parola che sostituisce addirittura la frase ci dà il fatto la, la composizionalità manipolativa del linguaggio complimenti complimenti adesso parleranno i miei relatori mi scusi ma ci tenevo ci tenevo lei è un asso è bravissima la vorrei nel mio gruppo è bravissima noi diciamo quello che voi dite L'ha detto lei nell'immagine di questa sera, con un calore e un idioma particolare delle, delle scienze pubblicistiche umanitarie. Complimenti, complimenti. Thank you very much. Just, just about, we won't give her away, so I'm sorry for this, but we can, maybe we can share. So. Elisa, do you want to uh, reply to this or? Yeah. Um, oh, thank you very much, uh, Rita Maria Bucciarelli. It's an honor for me to listen. I, 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 Can you hear me? I'm, this is a noise. Okay. Um, I prepared uh, I prepared this seminar for a lot of reason, um, reasons, but firstly for the need to find a way to create a dialogue, a dialogue with people, with us, and to disseminate this case studies also, and that we're strongly connected with uh, the present hydrological situations and related also with the present environment and uh, uh, in the case of venice there is also this hot problem of managed high water i mean a very actual and a real issue for us so therefore it is complicated also for me to 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 explain the actual importance of these past events to people but this is very important to do and this is the reason why also i invite you to to do the questionnaire because i, I need to 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 grow and but i think that is necessary and um, i mean this my approach directly focus on uh, transfer uh, as much as i can uh, the awareness of these territories and to respond to um, To, to a real issue and um, but we are still talking uh, about cultural heritage uh, cultural and landscape heritage uh, according to the code to our code to the article 131 for instance that uh, where um, the term of landscape is defined uh, as a, a part of the territory and whose characteristics are derived from nature and the history of humanity itself so is a, a wonderful interrelationships more question if you uh, don't want to write your question into the post just leave a note in the chat that you uh, would like to ask a question by voice so that's that's also welcome There was a very early intervention by Marianna Greco. If you want to. Hello, Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Uh, I, congratulate, I congratulate as well uh, on your very interesting work and take the opportunity to introduce myself. I am Marianna Greco. I am a member of a, a group who's co uh, which is called IRIS. This group is interested in linguistic literary events. Uh, it is interested in educational software. It, um, the, the group is, is interested in a more general sense of communication, images, sounds, words, text comprehensions, comprehension, sorry, and text in general. Our research is validated by physical and mathematical theories, also using Einstein theories. One of the experts in this is Amida Banjodi. It would be interesting to bring our research all together <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, so, um, I think that's all. 
Uh, could you please post maybe a, a link? Sorry, another more thing. Oh, one of the, the, one of the um, uh, software the group has created uh, is Digital Intelligence, uh, who is composed of different uh, types of software. Um, uh, one of these software is uh, uh, not only translate in different la languages, but uh, but even translates uh, iconic languages such as Chinese, Japanese, and uh, languages for deaf people. I think that's all. Sorry. <laughs> I think it would be very useful if you post uh, a link or some reference into the chat and everyone can then follow uh, this reference and maybe even get in contact, so including Elisa. Thank you. I'm sure will be interested in learning more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm checking the chat for further. Okay. okay. Yeah, Elisa? Yeah, no, I, I'm thinking about uh, your the last uh, uh, intervention um, because I, I think that the point for education, um, the point is the public also the, also the public perception here, no, uh, of the past of our cultural heritage. Um, this is a very uh, important for future uh, construction construction of institutional and professional identities also within a possible changing or in the museum practice and um, yeah it is uh, and on uh, the visitors experiences uh, and mini making and processes for instance now in the future museum so we had to, to balance both the professional expertise and public engagement in their practices and and for this reason there are a lot of uh, private um, companies in europe that create immersion room able also to develop or influence and take control of, of their own learning so the positive impact of um, of an immersive space can be seen through throughout also the school as uh, such a sort of improving behavior and well-being and uh, creating also a greater engagement in this sense and this transformational learning uh, in a sort of state of art environment is proven in europe uh, and it represents a, a sort of creative way to make culture still unknown in italy i think less unknown Thank you. I read a lot of compliments in the chat, but no further <laughs> questions if I, I'm not missing any. They are um, um, compiling the questionnaire, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, just, I mean, uh, I think I can mm -hmm. ask this question because you know how much I appreciate your, your work and I, I like your approach. Uh, is, is there, uh, in your regard, um, a differentiation or a border between imagination and entertainment and so is this, uh, is this a stupid differentiation if there were, were this if, uh, was this uh, uh, differentiation or don't you see any problems with this compared to other media so the more media so I mean as a media um, pessimist you could say that imagination is maybe even reduced I don't know just asking. No, no. Um, immersive rooms are, um, are, are very popular and uh, used not, not only in the um, cultural heritage. Uh, I see that there are two analogous ways of uh, use, private and public. And in the private use, there are companies in Italy and in Europe that use uh, this kind of tools, uh, this kind of instrument, this kind of structures for business also. Okay, so it, 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 you can uh, space from digital technology 
manufacturing, fashion, uh, automotive in in industry, marketing, gaming, and research also. And so it's a very large space. Uh, there is also hotels now. Uh, one is very new in Milan <laughs> that you can also, for instance, enjoy your wedding in an immersive room. So there are a lot of experimentation for this kind of uh, uh, new innovative uh, um, technologies. And um, for the public use is very beautiful because there are immersive rooms in archaeological museum that uh, are also very big in a bigger way not as my dark cube uh, as, as you've seen but you can take a look at the multisensorial uh, experience of the mitraeum of the temple of mitras in london a project of museum of london archaeology where visitors enters enters the uh, this underground temple museum uh, through the new bloomberg space uh, and uh, in the underground, there is uh, this ancient site. Lies the, um, the lies the um, how can I say the the curse of one of the old London's lost river, the, and the site was highlighted with the construction of this new cultural hub. So uh, inside there is uh, uh, there are a lot of projection uh, experiences sound and uh, also with uh, a gaming approach interactive approach so it is amazing uh, one for all <laughs> so uh... Kike Kualan wants to comment on, on this or something else yes uh, uh, thank you very much Elisa for the presentation um, I know uh, Elisa worked uh, quite well, so it was a pleasure to, to, to listen to the seminar. And I take the opportunity of the seminar also having uh, uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, different people participating with different background to, 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 to reflect about the ontology of the uh, digital uh, the, the, the narrative uh, through the uh, digital uh, self-immersion tool uh, applied to archaeology. What I mean is that, so uh, when we use uh, uh, this fantastic media to narrate history, in this case, a history of landscape, and we use uh, a tool that is uh, uh, very technological and very... Um, uh, assertive in one way. So it tells you a version of a history. What is the problem in rebuilding the different perspective that may uh, possible in, um, determine, have determined in the past what happened in the landscape? For example, uh, this, the example of the church. The church was being uh, was rebuilt over the old one after the flooding and the alluvional level and so on. Uh, not only because the river, but also because that was the original place of the church. It was property, uh, uh, property uh, issues uh, linked to the bishop. There was a, um, issues related to the, the, the memory of the place, uh, cultural and so on. And so uh, people in the past, when they do something, they uh, when they did something, they, they uh, answer to the landscape, but they also they uh, they follow different paths. So it depends if we see the, the landscape transformation from the point of view of the bishops or from, from the point of view of the landscape, and we can have a very different narratives. So my question is, when we prepare this kind of material, how much we have to be post-processual and so let open many, many different uh, possible ideas and possible stories, or uh, we need to stick to a major narrative because the tool is quite compelling in uh, time is time consuming and so we have to produce one or two main narratives so which are the issues in uh, in this perspective in your opinion oh thank you for your question <laughs> it's I, very i know it's that very, it's impossible uh, to answer uh, eh? <laughs> 
it's uh, it's it's very difficult to 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 find a, a, a an answer only answer <laughs> but uh, um so what can i say to you uh i start from my experience so um i start for for a need uh the need to uh to i can say um to communicate these these uh, these events, and people are they are very uh, they are in the, very uh, afraid from for my um, new research, especially for the crypta, uh, because the crypta was the original name of the church. And when I said no, this is a church. Uh, uh we, which is the church uh, the crypta no it is a church but no the church is the other so there is it, it depends from the point of view and it's also very difficult to find uh, a main narrative way the one narrative way and uh, i i also that I say that um uh, it is important also to keep in mind that my i have other lucky colleagues or oh, lucky colleagues that have an active uh, excavation campaign project open and with uh, archaeological site visible also no and and during the excavation you can also open it to people two three or more time during the excavation campaign and uh, but in this case uh, in my case is all you know it is also a problem because the, the example here investigated in adria and in santillario there are no we are not in presence of archaeological apart from the crypta the church uh presence of archaeological uh remains so uh we do not have it evidences and uh, it is a question it is a question how to render public public archaeology public uh how to find a public meaning uh, to uh something apparently invisible and um, i have to think about your question more so thank you very much <laughs> no no i i knew that that was uh, because it's a question that i ask to myself all yeah. the time when mm -hmm. i try to communicate so yeah. how much of the complexity of the interpretation that in archaeology is very often something very blur and very uh, undefined is needed to be uh, to be reported to the larger public so how much we have to to declare our yeah. path the the, the 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 path that we need to reach these results or the other results, and how much, uh, on the contrary, we have to, to play a educational role and leave aside the, uh, the complexity. So yeah. that, that is, is a quite a complex thing. And when it comes to a storytelling, yeah. a, a narrative imprinted in video that has a fixed length, a fixed time, you have to, mm -hmm. to, to, to make uh, a lot of choices. And I think that is quite, uh, yeah. uh, uh, is, is a quite a problem that... Uh, a challenge. Uh, so it's it is a challenge. But it is not to make the right choice. Yeah. Thank you very much. But I, I, I trust you and Elisa that uh, so more than, than others to make these choices, <laughs> these unavoidable choices. And I am just a personal note. I see myself when I love cinema and uh, I get into history very often, even though I studied history, so I uh, should be always very cautious. But I see myself being immersed in history and then have films, cinema films, as a starting point, then to emerge uh, or immerse myself fully into 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 a story or into the history. So, I mean, it's all about imagination in the end, and balance this with with data. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, Thank if you. there are no further okay. comments, questions, <coughs> coughings, <laughs> uh, I would Coffee. Thank you once again very much, Elisa, for this very impressive uh, insight in your work and into the world of public archaeology by apply applying immersive technology. Thank you very much. Hope to see you very soon uh, in Venice again. We will meet next week here in uh, at the same place, uh, same time for our next um, Uh, seminar on digital and public humanities by uh, this time by Barbara Tramelli, also a research fellow at the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities, and she will talk about her research project situated in the field of digital art history and uh, digital book history uh, on the iconography and uh, the secret life of images in and independent from early modern prints. And the title will be Le Chemin uh, de l'Image in the Renaissance uh, Lyon, Digital Tools for the Study of Early Modern Illustrations. So you will, will find all information uh, on our website and uh, all the requirements to register. And I would like to remind you that also next week there will be the presentation by Diego Calaon, his dramatic talk on sinking Venice. Uh, so uh, this will be advertised as well. What's the date and the time, if you can remind Diego or Massimo? Next Thursday. Next Thursday. Thursday, okay. And Thursday, 5 yes. p.m. as usual. Okay. And you'll find information about how to register on the website of the research institute i suppose uh, actually usually you are reached by the emails of the institute on the mailing list and then you have just to ask for the code and that's, that's okay it. okay very good whoever wants to join they can also write their name now if they're not in the list already just in the chat so that you can get uh, their contact info. sounds very exciting so i, I will be there yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. See you again next week or earlier if you thank are you. part of the team. And uh, take care and bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Hey.